Hi there. This is an extra video to part one of our logic series. I want to talk about the idea of abstraction, which is an important part of any subject, but especially logic. I'm going to give my explanation of what abstraction is and what I hope is a fairly simple example. But if this video leaves you confused, it could just be my explanation not working for you. All subjects have their own abstractions and you might see abstraction a little different from me. The world is made of real objects that we can move around and use, but when we make any kind of plan for the future, we have to think about possible objects, or maybe possible ways that real objects can be. Whenever we think about possibilities in this way, we're making something abstract. We are moving away from the actual world, but we are hopefully doing it in an organized and useful way. In this video, we'll go through an example of abstraction in many levels of detail. But just to be clear, you don't need all these levels every time. All of these levels of abstraction cross over each other, especially now in the computer age. Some abstractions don't even really make sense. The important thing you need to think about is which abstraction is useful to you right now for the problem you are trying to solve. Like in this situation, imagine you are organizing a large dinner party at a hotel. You have rectangle tables which can seat six people around them, but you're going to put them end to end in rows. How do you work out how many chairs are in each row or how many tables you need altogether? The most direct way to answer this question is just to set up real six person tables. Whoop and then count the chairs. If you do this, you will probably notice that when you put two tables end to end, you actually lose two seating places where the two ends are compared to a single table alone. But maybe you can't set up in a real room. No problem, you can make model tables and chairs and then you can actually answer the problem in a much smaller space. You could even use other things to stand for tables and chairs like pieces of card or pens and pencils. Actually, why even have models at all? If we want, we can just imagine tables in our head and visualize what they look like in rows. Wait. <laughs> When we look at them like this, we can easily highlight the difference between the chairs on the ends of a table and the chairs down the side of a table, maybe by using different colors or something. But imagining chairs and tables is a lot of work. And I'm not even kidding there. If you ask someone to picture real chairs and tables in their heads and make sure they see all the details, they probably can't keep count of the chairs at the same time. Schematics, either in your head or on a page, can give us the best possible view to get only the information we need. Often, for real objects, this is a top-down plan view. Like here, we can easily see the table and all six chairs at one time. We can then add these into rows, remembering to take out the end chairs, and we can see that every table has four chairs, and then the two ends of the row have one chair each. If we want to be quick, we can just show the chairs as marks around the table. We don't need to see them as objects in space. We only care about the numbers here. If we do this, it doesn't make anything easier to understand than a simple schematic. It's just a bit quicker to draw. Now we start to get really abstract as we come to semantics. Semantics is about words and their meanings. At this level of abstraction, why even have a picture? A few words can give us the answer to the question we want. How many chairs are there in a row of tables end to end? Well, we need four chairs for every table, plus two chairs for the ends of each row. Of course, you do need to understand the situation for this answer to make sense to you, so you will probably have some kind of image in mind, but these words do give us a clear answer to what we're trying to find. At the final level of abstraction, at least for this video, maths is all that's left. 
The number of chairs, C, is an expression in one variable, n, where n is the number of tables. C is 4 times n for the number of tables, plus 2 for the end chairs. If we wanted, we could multiply this by r, the number of rows, but let's not for now. A basic algebra expression like this can count our chairs, but complex ones can do so much more. If this is your first time learning about abstraction and it's a bit strange or confusing to you, then that's probably enough for now. Go and practice with some of these ideas in your other studies and think about how you can make the ideas you're thinking about abstract. But if you're still okay with everything up to now, then we can go further and talk about abstraction even more abstractly. If we take our abstraction one step further, we get to the patterns behind the maths. We know that if we set our tables end to end, we can make an expression for the number of chairs. Now that we understand how that expression works with one arrangement of tables, we can do it with other arrangements of tables. Take a look at these arrangements of tables. What expression would we use for the number of chairs C? And can you see an important detail we might have missed if we are seating dinner guests in squares like this? Pause if you want some time to think. But above, the arrangement is very similar to the example we used, except that the tables are now put side to side instead of end to end. So we only have two chairs for each table, the two end chairs, and then we have two chairs at each end of the row. So the expression for C this time is 2n plus 4. In a square, you might notice that all the tables in the square lose two seating places. In the bigger square, the corner tables look a little bit different to the side tables, but every table around the square has four chairs. So the expression for C is simple, 4n. The number of chairs is four times the number of tables. But if you are setting up tables in this way, remember that there is no place to walk into the middle to get to the chairs on the inside. So unless your dinner guests are happy to crawl under or climb over their tables, that might be something to think about. If there is anyone watching this video who wonders why they need to learn logic, then well done, you stuck with it this far. But seriously, logic is all about abstraction, and we make things abstract so we can get to an answer quicker and more reliably, provided all our information is good. Answers are, at the end of the day, binary. Yes or no. You do this thing. You don't do that thing. Answers are important, but it turns out the world is complex, so the long-term effects of our decisions are hard to know. All of this points back to what I said in the main video. Logic can never make moral judgments, but that doesn't make it useless. The scientist Eugene Wigner commented that mathematics is unreasonably effective in science. What he means is, it is far better at fitting with reality than we might expect. Everyday life is usually chaotic and unpredictable. Something as precise as maths that works in understanding the world around us is actually quite surprising. This is often shown in this diagram. Maths draws lines which are far too sharp for the real world, but we can see the same form in both images. This diagram, and even Wigner's statement, is an oversimplification, and that is one of the dangers of abstraction, missing important details, like in the squares of tables we saw above. And one of the problems with humans is, we are pretty good at missing important details. Even if Wigner's statement is right, there is still a lot that maths cannot tell us, because we simply don't understand the details of the problem. 
One human brain is built for living in a small village and producing food to live, not dealing with high-level abstractions. So this is why we have to build some systems, either in our heads or in the world, to keep and organize the details that we could never analyze in real time. That's all logic really does, which is how logic can end up being both awesome and awful. It's not about what logic is doing, it's about the ideas that people are putting into it. So I hope that's helped you to understand abstraction and how it's useful in logic. Don't worry if you don't have it clearly yet. Abstraction is a very abstract topic, so that makes it quite hard to understand, especially the first time you come across it. You can watch this video again, or try and find another video on the subject, which might work better for you. Hi, hope you found that interesting. Like, comment, subscribe, etc. If you prefer shorter videos, you can find this cut up on our other channel just up there. But whatever you do, please keep learning something because no matter who you are or how old you are, every day really is a school day. Bye for now.